The following sermon is by Manny Alaniz, pastor at St. Stephen's Chapel in Northwest San Antonio, Texas. For more information, for prayer, or to support us financially, please visit our website at stephenschapel.org or call us at 210-241-5969. is wrong with this world. Let us prepare our hearts to hear God's truth through the preaching of the word, which begins with prayer. Let us pray together. O oh, gracious and merciful Father, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, from your holy mouth. Let the heavenly food of scripture nourish us today through the preaching of your word, open our hearts and minds, set our souls ablaze in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the true bread of heaven. Amen. Please be seated. I ask you again, what is wrong with the world? With all the things going on in the world today, with a war between Israel and Hamas, the Hamas terrorist, with a war between the Russians and Ukraine. What is wrong with the world? Because of all this, tensions in those regions are extremely high. So much so that, that the conflicts going on in these areas has threatened to erupt into global warfare. Yeah, these are. These are wars and rumors of even more wars still to come to spread worldwide. What is wrong with the, with the world? We do not need to omit our own country. When we look at what's going on within our own nation, we can certainly see that there is a political divide. There is true division between the two major political parties, so much so that there is hatred, real hatred between the two parties to the point that they want to annihilate each other. That does not, it does not stop there. It does not stop with the political divide. There, there is war in our society. With the various identity groups wanting to dominate our mindset and change our worldview, this has erupted into violence in our cities, which has spread into our neighborhoods and even into our own backyard. But it goes deeper than that. Hatred, violence, and war has penetrated our social structure. It has infiltrated and slowly changed our morality, the morality of the nation. Our society is now calling what is good from a Christian standpoint. They are calling what is good evil. And our society is calling what has long been identified as evil. They are calling that good. This has trickled down into our families and our family units, even to the point of, in, of in, in infiltrating our churches, some of our churches. Dear friends, it's gotten so bad that recently, and I mentioned this in another sermon, that the state of California, the California State Legislature, attempted to pass a law that would prevent parents from interfering in their children's decision to have a biological gender change operation. That's madness. It's madness. So if someone talked about being having uh, all the spiritual warfare that surrounds us. Listen, there's war on an individual basis. 
Holy Scripture states that humanity in its fallenness is at war with one another. But it's even worse than that. Humanity in its fallen state of being is at war against God himself. God himself. So the question remains, what is wrong with the world? Back in 1905, the Times newspaper of London invited several prominent authors and thinkers and asked that very question. Asked that very question, what is wrong with the world? They invited those prominent authors and thinkers to write an essay in response to the question, what is wrong with the world? A theologian of that day, by the name of D.K. Chesterton, responded and wrote a letter to the, to the editor of that newspaper. He responded to that question. His response was short and to the point. It was concise. He wrote, Dear Sir, I am, and he signs it, uh, G.K. Chesterton. See, no truer words have ever been spoken. What is wrong with the world? I am wrong with the world. You are wrong with the world. We are wrong with the world. That is what's wrong with the world. It is us. We are part of the problem. We're certainly not part of the solution in our fallen state of being. We, all of us as true Christians, we know how the human drama is going to end. We do. It's written in Holy Scripture. The Bible tells us that God will bring an end to this fallen, broken world. This is called the end time eschatology. The end time eschatology. The end of time judgment. At the end of time judgment is coming. Ah, but see, the word of God also gives us an eternal hope. Well, and we had it read just a couple of minutes ago. Christy read it. The word of God gives us an eternal hope. We have heard and read that today. Our only hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you heard his voice? Have you heard the voice of Christ calling out to you? Realize eschatology unites the here and now with the end of time. Eschatology, the here and now, that's the realized. Eschatology is the end time. It unites the, the here and now with the end of time. It occurs when you and me, when we respond to the call of Christ, and thereby we pass from death to life, now and forevermore. Everyone living today, who answers the call of Christ, will pass out of death into eternal life. Theologians, again, call that realized eschatology because it doesn't change. You receive Christ. You answer the call of Christ. You are saved at this moment, at the moment you respond. And you will be saved now and forevermore. At the end of time, you will be saved. That's the critical issue of our text, the voice of Christ calling out to you, us. Have you been transformed by the voice of the Son of God? Friends, as we look at our passage, we must realize that we're treading on holy ground. We are treading on holy ground. The Lord Jesus Christ makes one of the most emphatic, resounding, powerful, eschatological, end-time statement found in the Bible regarding salvation. 
the Lord is talking about eternal salvation. Here again, listen to what the Lord says in verse 25. He says, truly, truly, I say to you. He repeats the, a phrase that he had already talked about in verse 24. He repeats it, truly, truly, I say to you. Basically, what he, the reason he's doing that is for emphasis. He's making a solemn statement, a solemn announcement. He's announcing the truth of what will happen. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here. An hour is coming and is now here. A transformational change, a time change. For an hour is coming and is now here. Our Lord uses, this, again, the same phrase in, in verse 24, but he also uses the same phrase in, in chapter 4 of the Gospel of John when he is speaking with the Samaritan woman. And when he is speaking with her divine truth, she goes through a transformation, a transformational change. In our text today, our Lord continues his transformational statement saying, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. Jesus is not only making reference to the people who are dead in the future, not only talking about them, he's also making reference to those who are living today, today, now, but are destined to die. See, we are all destined to die. Oh, what a big surprise. We just don't ever think about it. And sometimes we come face to face with it when a loved one passes. But all of us, are destined to die. What would you do if this was your last day to live? You didn't know it. Destiny. We're all going to the grave unless Christ returns before we die. We, in our broken, fallen state of being, are going to die in our trespasses. Jesus is speaking to everyone who has ever lived and died. He's also speaking to everyone who is living at this very moment, now, and will die. Holy Scripture confirms that, confirms what our Lord is saying, that in the future, at the end of the age, when Jesus returns, the dead will hear his voice. And you may have a loved one that has passed. And it, it, we, we have been told something about what happens for those who believe. We are told that they're absent from the body, though this is the physical body. Our souls will live forever. We are absent from the body, the physical body, but we are, our souls are present with the Lord, not knowing exactly what that means. But the interesting thing is that we, our physical bodies are dead. They're in the grave. They're there. They're, they're, they're dead. Our souls are with the Lord. But see, here's what's interesting. This is what Scripture tells us. That when Christ returns at the end of the age, at the end of time, to judge the living and the dead, when he returns, he will call out those who are dead. And it tells us that they will rise and go to be with him. That's not a conflict. And during that time, when they rise to go to be with the Lord as he is entering, as he is coming, we, they will be joined. We will be joined with an imperishable body. We will become human again. To, to be human means body and soul and spirit. The dead will be called out and will live in the kingdom. Here's what's even more remarkable. That future hour, according to Christ, is occurring right here and right now. 
that future hour is occurring right here and right now at this present moment. The future, the future is right now. I don't know if that strikes joy to your heart or fear. It could, and I know it strikes joy to your heart because you're saved. But it could strike fear in our hearts when we know loved ones that are not. Those who hear the voice of the Son of God calling out to them today will not just live in the future. They're going to live right now, today, at this very moment. They're, li they're going to live. They're coming to life right now. The future begins today. The future began when you were born again, and it's continuing at this very moment. It's going on. In order to hear the voice of the Son of God calling out to us to rise from the dead in the future, at the end of the age, we must respond to his calling right now. If you don't respond to his calling while you're alive, you're not going to hear him calling at the end of the age because he's not going to be calling you. There has to be a response. We're not puppets. See, God is so beyond us, right? He is so beyond us. We cannot comprehend the, the, the magnitude. When, when we're told that you were chosen before the creation of the, of the universe, when he, before he spoke the universe into existence, he chose you to be saved. And then now we're being told at the end of the age that you, did, if you didn't respond, if you haven't responded today, at the end of the age, you will not be called. It's a lot. It's a lot. But it's also a reminder that you are a part of what's going on. You are a part of what God is telling us. You are required to respond. Don't be caught up with, when you share Jesus with somebody, don't be caught up with somebody saying, I, you know, I don't have to tell you nothing. I don't have to do nothing. I know Jesus. I don't, have to, I don't have to respond. No, you do have to respond. It requires a response. All this is tied to Jesus being the Son of God, sonship, the expression to have, to have life in himself is a reference that shows that the Son of God the, uh, the, the God the Son shares in God the Father's power. One God revealed to us in three persons. For well, the Father has sent the Son clothed with all the authority of the giver of life. He is the source and giver of all life. That includes eternal life. That includes salvation. And notice. Jesus, as the Son of God, is called the life giver. In verse 27, Jesus is also, is also given the authority as being the judgment giver, for he is the Son of Man. The judge is a human. God, man. Judge. Here we have a clear reference when it states that he is the Son of Man. That's a clear reference to the Old Testament book of Daniel, chapter 7, where the Son of Man is seen coming down from the clouds of glory. The Son of Man in, in, in Daniel, chapter 7, is an eschatological, end time, end of the age figure. This person is clothed with divine qualities and adorned adorned with the authority to judge the living and the dead. To be clear, the title Son of Man is a self-identification that Jesus used. He identifies himself as the Son of Man that goes back to Daniel. Anybody that would have heard that would have would have traced that back to Daniel chapter seven. 
our text makes it abundantly clear, apparent that Jesus is not only the Son of God, the creator of life, he is also the Son of Man who will bring judgment. Jesus is the voice. So why should we marvel and wonder at the sound of the voice of the Son of God at the end of the age? Well, because all who are in the tombs will hear that voice and come out. Now, when it says all, it means all. Now, those who, as it states, those who have done good will be resurrected to life life everlasting so the question would be well what does it mean those who have done good like can you be good enough no what it means is those who have done good have been born again they have been transformed by god himself their ears have been opened their hearts have been changed they heard the gospel message and they responded to it in faith they responded to it in belief that is the good, and they shall be resurrected to everlasting life. But see, everyone's going to be resurrected. Anyone who has died, everyone who has died, everyone will be resurrected. Those who have done evil will be condemned, resurrected to final condemnation. Now, what 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 is the evil? Well, the the evil that it's talking about is the ultimate evil. What is the ultimate evil? What would you think is the ultimate evil? The ultimate evil is rejecting the Son of God. That is the ultimate evil. You have no, you have no hope. You have absolutely no hope. That is the ultimate evil. You turn away from God himself to be condemned. Jesus, again, is making this solemn announcement that impacts everyone. Everyone. So the question is, have you been transformed by the voice of the Son of God? That's the gospel. See, that's the gospel. That's the gospel call. Have you heard it? Have you responded to it? Your eternal soul depends on it. Back in that January of 1996, a movie came out called Dead Man Walking. Dead Man Walking. I don't know if anybody's ever seen it. You saw it? Okay. Dead Man Walking. This movie is about a man who is in a penitentiary. He is on death row. So he's already been tried. He's, and appeals, and appeals have all happened, and, but he's on death row. He's awaiting to be executed. The inmate maintains his innocence throughout the whole ordeal. And he's able to talk a nun, a Catholic nun, of the name of, of Sister Helen, to help him with a yet another appeal. Appealing his conviction to no avail. When it doesn't go through, it doesn't work. So Sister Helen tells this man, who's going to be executed, she says to him that his redemption is only possible if he takes responsibility for what he did. And before he dies, before he is executed, he confesses cheerfully. He confesses to Sister Helen that he did commit the heinous crime, that he did murder husband and wife. This movie leaves us a lot to be desired because we know the, the story of redemption. And we know that our only hope is in the life and work of Jesus Christ, believing in the life and work of Jesus Christ. By that, in that, we repent. That leads us to repentance. And we live a life of repentance and faith, repentance and faith. Now, remember the second part of that. You do want to repent. To repent, you're going to have to identify that you're sinning, that you sinned. And boy, we have struggled there. We're good at justifying what we do, really good. So first, repent. You have to identify, yes, I have sinned. But don't forget the second part. The second part is 
it is just as important. You have to believe in the promises of God. Believe God. Believe that you have been forgiven. Believe that you are saved. Don't let wickedness, the devil or his minion, talk you into thinking you haven't, you're, you're too evil. Man, you are just too evil. Not even God can save you. Don't buy into that nonsense. It is nonsense. A life of repentance and faith. So what do you need to hear when we read a passage like this? Well, you need to hear that we in our fallen state of being are all men, are all dead men walking, dead men and women walking. We are dead in our fallen state of being. And in that fallen state of being, we are waiting, we are awaiting final judgment. Have you heard the voice of Christ calling out to you? Have you responded to his voice? But somebody asked the question, well, what does that voice sound like? Am I hearing things in my brain? What is that voice? What does the voice of Christ, the voice of the Son of God sound like? Well, that voice sounds a lot like your voice. It sounds a lot like your voice, my voice, our voice. It sounds a lot like us sharing Jesus, sharing the gospel message with others. See, we are called to share Christ with others, to share the gospel message with others. We speak in a voice, and we speak to other broken people, fallen people, people who are not saved yet. We speak to them as we share Jesus with them. We are that voice. We are commanded to be that voice. We are a means to the end. God uses you as a means to, to that person's salvation. That is incredible stuff. That is like, golly, like me? I'm nobody. Yeah, but you're called to share Jesus with someone else. Oh, I don't feel like it. I'm very uncomfortable, man. I don't like doing that. In fact, I don't even like talking to people. In fact, I don't really like people. Oh, man, that sounds like somebody I know. Dear, near and dear to my heart. You know, when you say that, God probably gets a chuckle. He probably laughs and say, you're not going to engage my people. No, that's not going to work. That voice sounds like your voice, our voice. And we share Jesus with others. Have you done that? Have you shared Jesus with others? Souls are at stake. And we're a means to that end for their salvation. Have you heard the voice? Have you responded? If you haven't, it is not too late to respond. It is not. You're still breathing. And if you have responded to that voice, You've been saved, and you know you've been saved. There's an assurance there. There's a God promise there. But there's, there's always, a, this is always, this moment is always a good time to reaffirm your faith in Christ. Let us pray. You've been listening to Manny Alanese, pastor at St. Stephen's Chapel. For more information about our church, visit our website at stephenschapel.org or call us at 210-241-5969. Please join us prayerfully and financially as we seek to glorify God by preaching His Word and spreading the gospel of grace in boldness and selflessness.